Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll be beginning in just a moment. Thank you for your patience. Again, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Tamara and I'm happy to be hosting the Smart Factory webinar. Manufacturers generate huge amounts of valuable data, but it's not being turned into actionable data, which can improve productivity and profitability, as well as to enable predictive and intelligent data-driven processes. So what's holding manufacturers back? Now more than ever, it's critical to move forward with building a smart factory business case that can help you respond to dynamic changes and ensure business continuity. I'm pleased to introduce today um, our speakers, Raymond Russ, he is a Senior Director of Industrial IoT and Smart Factory, and Greg Pinkar, who is a Senior Director of Digital Manufacturing at Fujitsu. Ray and Greg will be addressing the biggest challenge of smart factory projects building the business case. They will walk through building an effective plan that will document the justification for undertaking uh, based on the estimated cost of development and implementation against the risks and business benefits and savings to be gained and navigating the new normal for manufacturers in these challenging times. Before I hand the mic over to Ray and Greg, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, uh, today's webinar will be recorded and it will be made available to you after the live session. Look out for an email um, from us uh, by Monday of next week. And uh, next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speakers, please feel free to send it through the um, ask a question tab at the bottom of the player. We'll be answering the questions at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with you specifically afterwards. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Ray. Uh, over to you, Ray. Thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Appreciate it. Uh, and and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, everyone, I hope everyone in your families are safe and well and um and uh, getting through this it will all go back to normal someday we hope uh, i'm hunkered down in chicago um i feel like i'm in uh, the omega man if you remember that movie with charlton heston or those that are too young um the remake was i am legend with will smith but uh, it seems kind of like that here downtown chicago um so real quick uh, next slide tam please so just a quick second here to, to, to tell you who we are, who Fujitsu is. Um, we're the seventh largest IT services company in the world. Uh, and Greg and I are part of that services team. But more importantly, we're also a manufacturer ourselves. Um, in North America, we manufacture North, uh, uh, network communication equipment. And we also manufacture scanners, servers, laptops. We even make air conditioners in, in certain parts of the world. Um, and so beyond, so that's where a lot of our expertise comes in this space. And then about 80% of our customers that that Greg and I work with, they're in the manufacturing space across multiple micro verticals. And that's what Greg and I's role is, is to work with our internal manufacturing teams, but also uh, with our customers to help them define um, and implement and understand uh, the smart factory roadmaps and how they can achieve uh, benefits from those roadmaps. Uh, next slide, Tim. So I'm gonna take the next two slides, take a second here and just talk about uh, pre-COVID-19. About nine months ago, we did a survey across uh, EMEA and the US to kind of to talk to manufacturers and what they were doing with Smart Factory, uh, what type of initiatives, what their challenges were um, and so forth. And, and, it's, and I'm gonna take a second and do that. And then I wanna talk about what fundamental changes are happening um, to some of these factors and where we think they're going and what's going to drive um, the challenges for Smart Factory moving forward. Um, and as you can see, it's interesting, 97% of manufacturers say uh, initiatives were a key strategic objective. But um, 
the, the bottom bullet on the left-hand side there is really more, a little bit more important uh, that a lot of companies have realized smart factory is important, um, but it's, it's clear that progress towards smart manufacturing was slower than it should be. Um, an interesting point is that while business cases um, and the cost of purchase and implementation were challenges, many companies were interviewed uh, so they were having good return on investment for the smart factory initiatives. I was a little surprised though when I did uh, see how low the challenges integrated in OT and IT um, were and the organizational challenges. Um, um, I do believe some of the challenges with, with smart factory really are, are, are cultural shifts that companies need to address. Uh, next slide, Tim. So thank you. And this is uh, the key findings that came out of uh, our um, our survey as well. Um, and it's interesting if you read the two bullets over on the right, well, most companies have a clear view on this high strategic importance of their smart factory initiatives compared to other projects. It doesn't say that they actually have started them or, or achieved them. A big part of our smart factory methodology and, and, and approach with our customers is to help them uh, build strategic roadmaps versus being stuck in a big term I kept hearing last year was POC purgatory. Um, and it seems like they were making strides there. A lot of the manufacturers I talked to last year um, were trying to identify the strategic roadmaps, not just do POCs, but actually find those projects that weren't just sexy, uh, but added value. Um, interesting, 80% of manufacturers said digital transformation had become a higher strategic priority over the last three years but more than 80% also thought their digital priorities would change over the next three to five years. And I bring that up because the COVID, then COVID-19 struck and they were proved right. So this is gonna make some fundamental changes to um, how companies are looking to start smart factory roadmap. Uh, next slide, Tim. Thank you. So going back and, and looking at smart factory and, and, and how it's evolved, whether you call it IoT, ITOT integration, um, shop floor systems. Um, some of the challenges we saw, you know, Greg and I going back 10 years ago and even as recently as, you know, a few years ago and even some um, smaller cases now, a lot of companies were trying to uh, do POCs, not really thinking about the overall smart factory uh, initiatives or roadmap um, and, and a lot of challenges there. And, and part of what we did was, was kind of figure out what we needed to do to help companies get there. Uh, we saw more POCs fail, um, and, and I, if I had heard one more time from the CIO, if, we, if we're going to fail, it's fail fast, and the, the challenge from us was always, uh, why, why fail at all? So let's plan out that roadmap. Let's, POCs and production pilots, more specifically, I think are good, and they could prove out a lot of value, but if you're only focusing on one of those POCs and you're not looking for true value, uh, then they're going to fail. A lot of the challenges in, um, in these projects also were the cultural differences between a plant and corporate. Um, so those teams not working together also caused a lot of failure. So the whole overall roadmap was to co-define uh, early on, you know, make, set the plan, plan out the overall roadmap uh, and the business value of what could be achieved and lay out that one, two, three, four, five year roadmap uh, with a series of initiatives. Um, we've d done a couple of projects with the companies where it's been as small as five and as many as 47 initiatives over a series of time, but all smaller projects um, that could be rolled out across a roadmap and every one of them um, adding value um, and, and having some type of uh, ROI or payback on it. Uh, next slide, Tim. So, thanks. So Greg made a comment to me yesterday, um, said that companies are in a firefight right now. And so this is, and this is the challenge for a lot of companies is, is um, I guess the three R's of the, the term I heard yesterday was the Cove economy, right? So nice little pun there. But uh, basically manufacturers need to, during this Cove economy, the three R's, reevaluate the risk to the current operational model supply chain. We got to keep the lights on and, and look what's happening right now. Uh, rethink uh, their focus on quick, easy wins in digitizing the factories and uh, reprioritizing transformation uh, change to evolve into smart factory, uh, leveraging industry 4.0 technology. So the big fundamental change that we've seen a lot is, I, I, my, ch my change in the opinion a little bit has, has come to the point that yes, we do might want to fail fast right now to um, for short-term projects to keep our workers safe, uh, but long-term we still need to think strategically how we're going to be when we come out of this. Um, so short-term effects, safeguarding consumer and work 
workforce health is a priority number one among businesses and governments. Um, the plant closures could continue to be necessary for manufacturers and, and hard hit regions for, for a long time. But uh, for companies vulnerable to a viral outbreak within their workforce, this could be a critical time to explore pro uh, proactive deployment of smart factory initiatives uh, to decrease worker density through their operations. Uh, most of us hope that this is over soon, but uh, um, anything and things will go back to normal. But many aspects are going to uh, are here for uh, for the future. Um, so from short term to major shift, you know, um, everyone remembers what it was like to travel before 9/11 compared to today. Uh, every major crisis, um, we have witnessed the implementation of short term measures that turned into social and economic shifts that lasted for generations. Um, the COVID-19 pand pandemic has already accelerated a number of consumer trends like online learning, working from home, uh, streaming services, video communication and consumer goods and services um, deliveries. Um, some are calling this a shut-in economy. Once a critical mass of consumers get used to certain behaviors, they tend to remain embedded uh, in our lives for years to come. So from a short-term perspective, um, this this pandemic hit manufacturers in an unexpected and unprecedented way. The first time in ma modern manufacturing history, demand, supply, and workforce availability are affected globally at the same time. Uh, companies that provide uh, and go vital goods like personal care, paper, pharmaceuticals, and maybe meat soon uh, are struggling to meet demand driven by panic buying. Others are experiencing dramatic drops in demand and extreme pressure to cut operational costs. Uh, every manufacturer is now experiencing disruptions across the supply chain um, and driven by what may not be recurring volatility of supply from Asia. Uh, social distancing employee safety measures put an additional level of pressure on manufacturers. 40 to 50% of workforces will be unavail unavailable to perform their functions on site. Um, and while office employees and knowledge workers are able to shift to remote work, um, in this new default operating mode, most factors are simply not designed to be managed remotely uh, and lack the digital tools and infrastructure needed to support such activities. We're seeing this a lot in projects already. Um, we have one client right now that we're, we're, we're doing an uh, OEE production pilot for them. They're not even allowed to go onto the shop floor, the ones that are in the office. We're doing the complete OEE production pilot remotely um, for site visits. I spend half my time in a, on a shop floor, not at corporate headquarters, but we're utilizing cameras uh, and video um, videos to be able to do a sight line and walk through the processes with the, with the users. Um, so that's going to be the new norm. Uh, Long-term effects. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, this presents a major change for us in North America. Um, you know, most of the trends here in this list uh, already started some time long, some uh, some time ago, but the current crisis will accelerate their adoption. So uh, manufacture remote work. So manufacturing still requires people to be physically on site and operators run machines. Need maintenance staff and even external vendors and contractors need site access. Um, you know, with social distance measures in place, manufacturers may lose up to 50% of their on site personnel. Um, Created a competitive advantage with digitalization. The past decade, uh, new technologies like AI, o IoT, um, have enabled tremendous efficiencies in predictability, predictability, capacity, availability, and flexibility of supply chain and manufacturing. Uh, McKinsey study found that companies that have embraced these technologies earlier are already seeing a 7% revenue growth over their peers. The economic and social turn downturn caused by COVID-19 will create a much deeper divide between manufacturers who have just started digitizing those who are much further ahead in their digital journey. Uh, data infrastructure strategic asset. Uh, greater connectivity will mean significantly accelerated deployment for industrial IoT, including sensors, uh, data visualization, remote collaboration tools, uh, and AI-based solutions across operations. And to complement supply chains, um, supply chains are experiencing an unprecedented level of shock, especially for manufacturers that rely on long and inflexible supply chains. Greater visibility and coordination across supply chain will enable better collaborate, collaboration with the wider base of suppliers, uh, ultimately driving the coupled highly efficient, most resilient supply chains. And 
the revival of domestic manufacturing. Um, manufacturing is going to come back to North America. Um, Western countries have become so reliant on offshore supplies for basic needs. Uh, we're now seeing the downside of decades of offshore production. And automation is going to be a key component of the effort to divide, uh, to revive domestic manufacturing. While all the previous offshoring trends were fueled by a race to the bottom in terms of labor and productivity costs, automation and robotics have drastically increased productivity across a number of manufacturing processes. Many of these processes could be easily reshored and deployed domestically. Automated manufacturing would not bring back demand for low-skilled low low labor, but will create new jobs and opportunities for digital, digitally savvy workers. Uh, next slide, Tim. So let's talk about our smart factory framework. And, and, and the one thing I want to make sure I define here is that our approach to looking at smart factory, and a lot of the POCs that we saw fail early on, even without before building a business case, was based on um, looking at the technology first. Hey, do we have a piece of shelfware or do we have a developer that's available to go build an application? So our whole approach was actually to not start with the technology, but have a technology uh, agnostic approach to building out a, a smart factory framework. Um, start with what is a smart factory and then look at the domains um, and the capabilities of what a smart, fact, smart manufacturer needs um, in their organization. Next slide, Tim. And I won't spend too much time on this slide. You guys have all seen probably a variation of this. Um, what is a smart factory or smart manufacturing? Um, obviously connected. Um, real time and this is one of the challenges that we've seen over the years that our companies are now uh, realizing they can get over is the real-time ability to have a shift a plant manager or a shift supervisor be able to make real-time information operational information he can get during a shift to improve quality or improve productivity he's not waiting for a report the next day or uh, someone in the next shift building uh, uh, building reports for him uh, when it's too late and then the intelligence, so the, the addition of artificial intelligence to be able to help uh, help workers uh, achieve smart factory benefits as well. Next slide, Tim. So once you define what smart factory is, um, it, it's smart then to define what smart cap. And again, we're still being technology agnostic. What are we trying to achieve with smart capabilities? So smart manufacturing operations, you know, everything uh, scheduling, dispatching, um, labor management, data collection, your MES systems. Um, this is what we're talking about here. Um, smart green manufacturing, regulatory compliance, energy management, health and safety. What are the processes there that we want to improve? Um, smart people. Um, training is going to be critical. It's already becoming critical. And uh, what can we do for um, uh, helping to train our uh, automated t our, uh, testing or sorry training for our users and workers um, and having those those tools there for them smart maintenance how we go from a to condition based maintenance solution to pdms um, maintenance resource scheduling planning uh, but also from an enterprise level as well um, one of the biggest uh, challenges we see, we see with the uh, maintenance or multiple plant managers having multiple plant maintenance solutions or applications uh, not being able to get understanding of what's happened at the enterprise level. Supply chain, facilities, logistics, suppliers, uh, and engineering, our PLM systems, product data management, uh, a couple examples, and quality management, documentation, limb systems, we work, uh, in process testing, reporting, compliance. Um, next slide, Tim. Now we start talking about technology. Once we've defined the processes, uh, or the domain areas that we want to focus on for smart factory. Um, the, the next step is then to look at the technology that can help us get there. Um, you know, a good example is our network communication uh, facility, manufacturing facility in Richardson, Texas. Uh, we've implemented augmented reality um, for the workers for an assembly machine of network. Every every single uh, piece of equipment is different. With augmented reality, that we've been able to reduce. Uh, assembly time on the shop floor uh, by 40% by using a uh, hollow lens and, and augmented reality for the assemblies there. So but this is when we start bringing in the technology um, and looking at how that can be an enabler to what the capabilities we are instead of the other way around. Next slide, Tim. 
So let's talk about the approach and methodology here. So, um, and then I'm gonna have Greg talk about the maturity model. So one of the two, one of the big factors we've seen over the years, and that we've seen companies be successful with Smart Factory, is having a top-down and bottom-up approach. Um, so, I mean, the first thing we try to do when we talk to customers and manufacturers is start with the C-level suite or the executives, VP of manufacturing or COO. What are you trying to achieve? Um, at the same time, working with the plant managers. Uh, all the way down to shift supervisors or operators, all stakeholders need to be involved. The biggest challenges we saw over the years of, of projects failing was because of the, the cultural shift of ITOT integration, which is really the plants and uh, and, and, and corporate um, objectives. Um, understanding the current state processes, what are the current KPIs, they meet best practices, um, and how will they change once we put in Smart Factory? Um, we also do a current state maturity model to show companies where they are in comparison to the industry and their peers. Um, and then a standard gap analysis. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about technology agnostic, but we also have to get our arms around the technology requirements. What's the current infrastructure look like? What's the ERP solution? Is there homegrown MES systems? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, um, how many plants are you know, uh, have age-old equipment that need to be retrofitted, but understand all those all those requirements as well. This example here, we show uh, an example of the four domain areas. Um, this was one of the larger ones, but the ability to actually define maybe a current initiative to, in a smart factory is is uh, quality management. We've done a few, quite a few projects where we focus on just one area or the other. Um, it's very difficult to say all seven domains at one time. Uh, that is a quite an undertaking for any organization, but to find those oh, those roadmap and um, domains based on what your current needs are, uh, both strategically and also from a risk perspective, especially based on what's going on now with uh, COVID-19. And the final report, business case, uh, and the future state maturity model. You know, part of what we've done is look at a, a roadmap. Let's say, you know, particular example I talked about was a four-year roadmap for a company with 47 initiatives uh, based on wave zero. Um, one, two, and three, you know, looking at um, low-hanging fruit, um, what are things we can do with our current system, just implementing best practices or, or training or, or things like that before we start looking into um, uh, some deeper technology to, to, to do that. But also showing where a company is going to get in a future state model through those phases. Um, for example, everyone says they want to be on predictive maintenance or PDMS now. Well, have you put in a condition-based maintenance solution offering yet? Um, you've got to take steps to get there. Um, and, and so thinking about that and, and how you're going to achieve that. Uh, next slide, Tim. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Um, the maturity model introduction, I'm going to have Greg walk through. Um, we've created a, our own Fujitsu maturity model we use with manufacturing, um, as well as a hybrid approach that Greg created as part of the team uh, based on Michael Hammer's um, uh, process enterprise maturity model that he's made a hybrid into for specifically for manufacturing. So, Greg? Hey, thank you, Ray. So, what we've done here is basically, if you think about, you know, your dom the capabilities that Ray had mentioned before, like maintenance or quality, what we've noticed is, is that clients, companies, manufacturing companies are somewhere along this continuum in each of domains. And in order to build the business case, you need to know where you are and where you're headed, you know, as we said in the prior slide, or I said in the prior slide, what is your current state and what is your future state? And what we've also found is, is that this varies not only by company, but it also varies by the manufacturing site. So some manufacturing sites may have their manufacturing operations somewhere between developing and maturing, and some may be just in the formative stage. So let me just take a minute and talk about the formative stage. That's the, you know, that's the best view of firefighting. So you have institutionalized knowledge with limited initiatives. And then as you move on to it, and we've all seen this, we've been working with applications that solve specific problems. You can, review to, you can refer to them as point solutions, and you can move to maturity, where now what you're doing is you're starting to connect your applications with your system of record, and you're being able to use that data to grace, basically create business benefit. One of the things in building the business case is, is that, again, you need to know where you are, where you're going, but you need to know how to measure that. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. 
Okay, so let me just take a minute here and, and we have two capabilities. We have manufacturing operations and we have maintenance. Ray mentioned before, and he talked about the fact, talked about condition-based maintenance and predictive maintenance. But in order to get there and build a business case, you need to know where you are in your maintenance journey today. If you have legacy systems and basically are suffering issues on the factory floor due to lack of a PM program, lack of spare parts, operating procedures, the tools to be able to do it, you know, you need to create that foundation in order to move up the ladder to talk about you know, CBM, predictive maintenance, as well as machine learning. And in doing that, you need to be able to mine the data. And when I say data, your financial data to say, what are you, you know, what issues are you suffering today? What are you losing in terms of your productivity? How much downtime, how much unabsorbed overhead, how much scrap are you creating? So that at the end of the journey, when you're actually building the business case and you've gone through the implementation, you will have that ability to go and back in and see where you stand, you know, measuring it over a period of time. And that's actually the validation. So when we say map and validate and create the business case, the time that you need is to spend upfront deciding where you're gonna see that benefit from creating whatever capability that you're going to be implementing on the factory floor and what is it gonna wind up with at the end and where may you be going from that? So you may start off with a very foundational maintenance program, move to condition-based maintenance and then move to predictive maintenance. The same thing from the shop floor as well too. If you're having issues with manufacturing data coming up in real time so that you can address it, you don't want to wait to the end of the shift or the end of the week to be able to see what your problem is. You wanna be able to take that data and you wanna be able to use it so you can improve your operation. So in deciding the scope of your project, you need to decide what are those gonna be those key success measures? What is the data showing now? And what will the data show? And when I say the data, the financial data, because the business case has to basically be balanced against the cost of implementation versus, for example, a recovery of a million or $2 million due to a reduction in scrap. Go ahead, to the next slide, T, and I'm gonna turn it over back to Ray. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. So one of the biggest challenges um, also that companies have is where to get started. And <laughs> just getting in, in, in so the, the, best, the best advice we can give is that you want to start with a one to two day workshop, take your best and brightest people and all your stakeholders. Um, I would say if you can work with a partner or if you have analyst, analyst relations, relationships, excuse me, work with an analyst as well to help drive part of your workshop so you can understand what other companies are doing, uh, what the art of the possible is, um, and start with a one or two day workshop to, to get down to that level before you go into some discovery and design with those teams. And as I mentioned before, the roadmap ultimately in defining what Smart Factory is for you long term is going to really help define who you are as a company long term um, after Corona, uh, COVID-19. But in the meantime, there are opportunities to do proof of concept or we recommend production pilots because you're actually looking at real data uh, and actually be able to prove out the business value. Um, but this is a, a good roadmap to kind of get to get started. Um, as Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the plan is useless. It's the planning that's important. So it's important to do that and make sure you include um, uh, all your key um, um, stakeholders in this process as well. Um, next slide, Pam. And uh, so I'm gonna go to the next slide, Tim. I apologize, I think we're running out of time. So I just wanted to finish up with this last slide. Uh, it's a tactical document we put together. You guys are gonna get a copy of this, but as I mentioned before, there's a lot of projects that are starting. Um, we did one last year as well for a company in, in China where we did an OEE uh, implementation completely remote. Um, I take that back. We were at corporate headquarters uh, in the US part of the time there. The project could have been done completely remote but the projects that are going on right now that we're doing, our teams are all remote. And um, and I highly recommend Teams. We've actually been able to integrate with a couple other of our customers and partners, Teams accounts as well. The old days of having to spin up a SharePoint site for collaboration are gone. You can get Teams set up in a matter of minutes, but uh, I'll leave this here for you uh, when you get a copy of this deck uh, for some best practices around doing remote discovery. Um, Tim, over to you. I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, I think we're at the half hour now. 
We did get a couple um, during the session, so let me just get through uh, those two. And if you have any others, please feel free to uh, submit them. Uh, Ray and Greg, what have you seen as the biggest challenges facing uh, companies face in building the business business case? Greg, you want to go first? Yep. Okay. Um, what we see as the biggest challenge is basically being able to to identify and validate the benefits. And when I say benefits, I'm talking about soft versus hard benefits. Sometimes what happens is, is that you're going to say, well, look, you know, I'm going to be able to, to view my analytics and, you know, my efficiency on the shop floor. But what you're not really saying is, is that what is it going to save you? Um, but I think the larger point is, is that being able to have manufacturing finance or however your finance organization is on your team saying that yes you know here's where we are today here's our losses here's our efficiency here's what our manufacturing statements are telling us and then at the end of it or basically as you're doing your predictions on how much money you have to save you're working with your financial team and once they're on board then your ability to get the project through the you know your budget committee your capital expenditure plan and approved becomes a lot easier so it's that upfront homework and it's that i'm going to say cross-functional collaboration that you need in order to to get the business case to present to the executives and get their buy-in thanks greg and i just just to add to that I, I know i've said it a couple of times on this call the culture shift uh getting your c-level executives your corporate level executives and your plant managers on the same page strategically is critical to make sure they're in agreement Okay, we've got another question that just came through. Uh, I've got two more actually. Uh, question came out, will we share the presentation? Yes, uh, on Monday you'll be getting an email with the recording and uh, the presentation, a link to the presentation itself separately. So we will. And the final question that I have is, how do you um, validate you're reaching your desired income once you've begun the implementation to Smart Factory? Ray? I'm sorry, one more time. How do you validate you are reaching your desired outcomes once you've implemented Smart Factory or have begun the process and implementation? Greg, we just talked about that this morning. You want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So let me give you a real time example of it. So what happens is, is that there was a, a project that we implemented and what we were able to do is to validate it had to do with a reduction in the labor. So Look, everybody's used to cost center accounting and, you know, firms do their cost centers differently. But in this particular case, you know, we identified upfront what cost center was going to be effective. And then once the project went live, then we were able to view literally, I'm going to say in real time, and when I'm real time, you could actually see what happens on a weekly payroll basis. What is the impact on this particular, particular case, the direct labor and indirect labor? So it's being able to identify upfront where your source of, you know, where the benefit is going to come from. But then again, being able to reach down into however your cost accounting system is working or is structured that you'll be able to extract that data and to see the difference. And I mean, there's no difference with yield variances or scrap or quality metrics. You know, there are ways to get to that data. The same thing with maintenance as well, too. So, you know, identifying upfront as you go into the project where we're going to, you know, what you're going to be looking at and how you're going to measure yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, so I think no more questions from anyone on, on the line. Thank you to our presenters. Thanks, Greg, Ray, and thank you, Greg, and thank you all for attending this um, webinar. As I'd mentioned, the recording and the deck will share, be shared with you early next week, and that concludes today's presentation. Thank you again, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>